Now we got up to 1900 in the last talk and we only have four talks left. Now I'm obviously not going to try and give you the complete history of Western music, but I'm trying to give you tips and ideas about how to get started as composers. This is all so much easier to see if we can look at the more transparent harmony of the older composers. But here we are now at 1900 and we see a sort of splitting between the pop music and the classical music. Now Mozart and Beethoven both let their hair down occasionally and wrote things which were more or less pop tunes of the time, but it certainly wasn't the case with the composers at the end of the 19th century. And certainly the split became almost irreconcilable. It's just now, in our present time, we find more and more people looking to see what other people are doing on the other side of the fence to see if they can't get ideas from one another. So, if you happen to belong to the pop tradition, please do have a good look at the classical and vice versa, because I'm sure there's lots of elements that we can take out of all of this. Now, quite typical for the sort of march music that was coming out of England and out of America. <laughs> Things like this. You know, it would go on like this. And then, of course, it only takes an African pianist to start thinking of, well, how can we just try and do a little bit of slightly more syncopated rhythm? <laughs> Scott Joplin and we're already on the way to something approaching jazz and the type of pop music that we were to find all the way through the 20th century. In New Orleans, uh, basically Louisiana was a French colony originally and there's still, even today, a very very strong French influence in the town. You'll find, um, you'll find the roots of what we now call the traditional jazz, which I'm not really going to talk about very much because I don't know anything about it really, but I would like to talk about the harmony because this is where we actually, again, where the threads meet and where we can certainly take a lot from one another. Now the easiest way to do this is to look at the chord symbols and we see what happens to them. First of all, straight C major, C7, and C with its major seventh, this we're all familiar with from Debussy. And C minor, of course, C minor 7th, and less common, C minor with a major 7th. But again, not too difficult to imagine. We have C diminished triad, and then the C, as we call it, a half diminished 7th, that's with a minor 7th. Again, this was the basis of our uh, Tristan chord, and very, very popular with every, all of Debussy's compositions. And the diminished seventh itself, of course. We've been using this since the Baroque time, nothing new about this. And the last one we add to the list is the C6, the C major with its added sixth. Just briefly on this one, some people will say, well, Beethoven was using this. Yes, he was, but when he used it, it was an inversion of this chord. It's a chord of A minor with its seventh. And if Beethoven does this, well, he'll probably resolve it like that, because he will have taken the root note and gone down two fifths. All right? But what we're talking about is this being a consonance and being all right to end a phrase there. Actually, you could look worse than at the, at the famous waltz, of course, of Johann Strauss. resolves, it's only a long appoggiatura, but by the time we get there, we've almost forgotten it, so it really, this is where, this is the first example I know of actually something which we can seriously call an added sixth, although as I say it does actually resolve itself. And now we can start seeing what's happened to jazz harmony. We take of course all of those chords that we've just had and we add this one to it, this is the added ninth. Janacek was very fond of this. He's not only a jazz prince, but it's certainly a, something we often use in jazz chords. And then the 6-9, 
we finally have a name for that chord we had in après midi that we had difficulty putting a name to. It's like an eleventh, but it leaves out that note. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it has a different character. The C seventh with an added sixth. And all of these can be used actually as consonances. We can end the phrases here, yeah? We're unlikely to end a phrase with a C13 with a flattened ninth. And the same goes for a C13 with a sharpened eleventh. These are rarities. You just need to know how to be able to read them. Nobody's going to expect you to read these things at sight. Now, we're staying with the basically major triads. And we have the C7th with a flattened 5th, and this can also be written with an F-sharp or a G-flat. Minor chords, well we have the triad with its 6th, CM6, the, the minor 7th with its 9th, and C minor with an added 9th. And whilst we're about this, we should talk about this diminished seventh, or the half diminished seventh, sorry, which is often written like this as a C minor seven with a flattened fifth. Five more. Now the augmented triads. Triad with its added seventh, a major seventh, and then with a normal seventh. Very rare, these chords in comparison with the others. And finally, the chords that don't have thirds at all, but have a fourth. Again, nothing new about this. This is called a C sus or a C sus four. Bach would have used that and would have resolved it. But here we now have it as a chord that we can end a phrase with, and we can have something here of the C seven with the sus. Now, I've chosen this song of Gershwin to practice this with. Uh, Gershwin, like Purcell and Schubert, uh, he never saw his 40th birthday and wrote a tremendous number of very, very lyrical and beautiful songs that, particularly if you, this is the style that attracts you, I could really recommend working with him. And his harmonies are almost the most complex of any of these composers. So, the first is just E flat, a triad. Well, that's very straightforward. I can do that. Seven, I can also manage, and B flat seven with a sus four. Okay, well this is that, and it resolves onto the D. Obviously, that's that second chord, and then E flat B flat seven is also no problem. An augmented triad, A flat. Added sixth, and then we have an augmented chord with its seven. Probably a resolution somewhere there, but anyway, F minor. And if I want to, if I want to read these things at sight, obviously I go much, much slower. If I find myself confronted with chords I can't read. E flat is no problem again. I have a B flat sus. Nine, so I need a G in there. Minor seventh, and then B flat seven to come back. Okay, so I'll show you how I do this now because if I want to read this type of thing, I write this out quite simply and put in the basic skeleton. Now, this obviously is not going to sound very exciting if I just play this.
So my next stage, if I want to do a version for piano or for any ensemble, the same rules apply as I was doing before, arranging Schubert or orchestrating or making arrangements as I was doing earlier on. The first thing I have to remember is I have five elements that I want to bring into this. I have the melody and the basic harmony. Well, I have this now. Then I have to imagine a bass line, which is obviously not this I'll never get away with. Nobody's going to buy this from me. But I could perhaps do something like this. Possibly it doesn't even need more than that, but it needs at least that much to liven the bass line. And then I have to think of a little bit of percussion, and that's probably going to go against the bass. Right? So then, if I want to do this for piano, well, I have to reduce it into the scope of my two hands, because I, obviously I don't have all that much at my disposal. But it's no problem to do that rhythm with the... It's already starting to come to life. But then, if the most difficult thing here now to do is to make an interesting accompaniment just for piano, to expand this to an ensemble with everybody playing these individual aspects, or even to a complete orchestra, is no problem, as we've seen when we expanded a two-part invention to a complete symphony orchestra. So, we've got the four basic elements already. We have the melody, harmony, little rhythm, little bass, and now we're going to talk about highlighting. Now, this is something that you can just introduce if you want to make a point of certain words, depending on how far you want to go. But the finest example I've ever come across of this type of highlighting is the Granger arrangement of this song. So you'll find that in the description of this video. You'll find a link so that you can actually find this in the internet, because uh, once you've seen that and heard that, there's no more to be said on the subject. That's all from me for today.